Welcome back to the Safety Storytellers Podcast. My name is Stacy, and I am your host, and I have the honor, the absolute honor of talking to Peter Suska. When you are done listening to this podcast, you will be full of knowledge. You will be inspired and ready to set this world on fire. He is so full of knowledge, so full of energy. He really looks at safety like a puzzle, very analytically, and he really um, focuses on process health. But the way that he tells his stories and the way that he um, gives his information is so fun. So you're really going to enjoy this episode. Welcome back to the Safety Storytellers podcast. I'm here with Pete Suska. I'm so excited to talk to you. Tell us about your safety story. Why is safety important to you? Well, I, I'll tell you how I got into safety. How's I love that? that. Yeah. Um, I was always a science kid and I was always interested in science. So when it came time to go to college, uh, I decided that I was going to go into a science field. So um, I started in in uh, geology and then went to chemistry and ended up in physics, believe it or not. I got a degree in physics. <laughs> now, the, now my, my physics classes were small classes of, of pretty much the same kids uh, through every class. And it was kind of like the Big Bang Theory group, uh, you know, Big Bang uh, series group. Uh, and, and I was Penny. Uh, you know, I was the one that really didn't know enough about physics and all these guys were nerds and I was, just enough, yeah, well, just enough to get by. So I, I kind of got by with a physics degree and the, uh, the leader of the physics department, who was a really nice guy, his son was named Pete and he kind of pulled me aside after, uh, you know, we finished the last class, which was quantum mechanics, which is crazy. And he said to me, Pete. Uh, if I were you, I wouldn't go into physics after you leave college. Uh, I said, okay. He said, yeah, my son Pete is in safety. And, you know, I was in the fire service at the time. I was a volunteer fireman. And I had that really nice combination of being practical and being scientific at the same time. And he said, you know, this would be a good fit for you. Uh, this kind of practical and, and kind of scientific field of safety. And, uh, you know, it, it took me aback. I guess I, I really really realized I wasn't meant for, for physics, but um, it was a nice, one of the starts of, of safety was certainly that, uh, you know, really getting me focused on something that was a lot more fitting to my skill set. Why do you think it's fitting to you? I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you've seen a change. Yeah, you know, I, I've, I, every single thing I've ever done in my life, um, purposefully, uh, you know, started with the fire service and, and safety is, is really about other people. Um, I, I, I don't see myself ever doing something that's making a part or making something that doesn't directly correlate to the betterment of, of human beings. And uh, so safety, you know, safety is a great fit for that. So mo a lot of what I do today is organizational. And, and uh, what I've learned is the the higher up I can go in the organization in terms of their capacity to make change, the, the more powerful uh, I am and the more powerful the principles I have uh, are applied in the organization. If, it, if I get to the CEO, that person can change an organization much quicker than I can person by person. Do you think that they care as much as you'd like them to? You know, when you get to the CEO level, um, uh, I, I believe that that those people see through a lot of things and and want to do the right things for the most part. Uh, I, I think the challenge is when you start to move down to the organization, uh, some of that gets um, diluted and changed, and and people um, uh, are focused on their own, you know, um, uh, needs and 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 their own realms, and 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 it's much more difficult to get change to happen. If I can get to a CEO and I can explain what I do and how it's going to improve the organization, and, and what I do is organizational improving, not safety improving, because safety is a symptom of organizational health. It's it's not something that we should be fixing. It's something we should be understanding. You know, it's the door opening to the world of the organization saying, you know, it's saying, hey, look, the organization is not functioning healthy. You know, let, let's uh, let's try to look inside the door instead of fix the door. You know, do they mostly want to talk ROI? Yeah, I mean, 
everything is ROI. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's how a business functions. I mean, think about it. You and I can't fulfill our values unless we have a certain amount of money, right? So, it, you know, values are nice, but money is what helps you fulfill those values. So the core of the organization has to be something that produces the funds to be able to sustain and grow, just like a family, right? And so it doesn't make a CEO a bad guy. No, no, not at all. It makes them a, a prudent... Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, they're looking at the health of their organization. It's, and it's really financial is the core of that health. And, and so what I'm trying to do is integrate safety into that. And, you know, the reality is, is that most people that go through MBA programs never get safety as a core element of that business leadership process. They don't learn that in the best schools in the world. So who's going to teach them? how to integrate safety into the value set of a business. Well, it's going to have to be us. Or what ends up happening many times is they learn from, from events or they learn from a culture of a company that they were in at one time, but they don't certainly learn it from school. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's left up to people like us to, to help frame safety as part of that value set that they have. I mean, for example, I was just talking to somebody the other day that I'd worked in their company for a while trying to help them. And he keeps saying, look, these, these folks, this leadership team doesn't get it. They don't get the safety stuff. They, they, they try, but they just don't get it. I said, well, let's focus on what they get. Yeah. Right. So let's, let's take, instead of going down the safety road, let's go down the business improvement road. And then as we improve the business, let's integrate safety into business improvement instead of try to force fit safety as a priority. It was, you know, don't force fit it. Follow the follow the road they're on. Follow the culture they're on. And I always say to people, go from people's comfort to your comfort, not from your comfort to their. Oh, that's you know I mean? so good. So, you really got to understand. I try to take time to understand the the kind of dynamic and the culture of the business, so I can fit and align the path that they need to follow rather than some generic path that, you know, seems to make sense. So when you were back in college and the person said, you should look at the safety, what was it in safety that had you leaning in and that had you leaning in one more time? What was it conceptually? I suppose you seem like somebody that's going to break it down analytically. Can you, can you tell that by looking at me? <laughs> I can't, because I, I don't know if there was an emotional component, but it, yeah, there is an emotional component, certainly. Was it more of like the, the puzzle pieces started fitting? Yeah, that's what it, yeah, that's it was puzzle. It, it was a puzzle. Yeah, I, I was probably a box of of turned over puzzle pieces when I started, right? And and you know, I do I do really use the puzzle analogy a lot. I said, you know, my my, my whole approach to things is made up by puzzle pieces that were given to me by other people, people that I've, you know, uh, worked with people that, you know, that gave me some piece of information. I, I'm a puzzle built out of, out of all of that. And the other thing is I was just telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, I'm not a good reader. I, and I've written, I've written 15 articles in the ASSP magazine, professional safety magazine, but I'm not a good reader. So here, here I am now a writer and I don't even read. And <laughs> And and funny how this world works. it does it does it, well you know a lot of what I learn comes from my ability it, just like if you have a deficit right you have a hearing deficit or, or something like that you, the other senses take over and my capacity to to learn from my environment is so much you know is so much better than my capacity to read so now. I am so good at extracting value, extracting connections and putting things together based on what I see and hear that all of what I talk about comes from the reality of what I've learned from, you know, my world. And um, yeah, so where, do, where does safety fit into that? It, it just made sense to me uh, that, you know, especially in the fire service, when you start in the fire service in the 70s, and the big change in the fire service was to try to put our firefighters up front on the list of priorities where we were back on the list. I mean, we were the last, we, we thought of ourselves last. Well, no, really think about it. We, our job was to charge in there and rescue and take care of people. Okay. And we would put, we would trade our risk for their risk. That's what we did every day. And we still do it today. Okay. Um, and, it, but 
But what we tried to do is try to figure out a more calculated way to do that. You know, instead of just running in there and, and, and doing what we do, to think about it a little bit in advance, to, to be able to say, okay, is this a winning situation? Are we going to gain more than we lose? You know, and, and what is our strategy and what is our tactics to be able to support that? And so I was part of that culture change in the fire service. And I think that's where the safety kind of uh, calibration came from is, is I could see that the fire service needed to change and we're, we're with respect for the past, but really to move us to the future to be better at what we do. It's a really huge nod to leaving um, things as they were because it's, it worked or it's nostalgic or there's history in it. Yeah. And it's, but you can give it a nod and change it. Yeah. And it, we have to continue to change. You're right, you're right. A lot of people don't want to do it because there's like there's, there's comfort in it. Um, there's also maybe some nostalgia in it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, and, and there's there's proven success in it. Right. There's a history of success. Why should I change? Uh, it's always worked for me. And I think the change in the fire service really came from the fact that we were we weren't dealing with ordinary combustibles anymore. We were dealing with foams and plastics and all these things, whereas we didn't have breathing apparatus in the old days. We could go into a house. We could stay low in the smoke and we were OK. Oh, no, uh, we didn't really. Yeah, when I first started, the breathing apparatus was in a box in the fire apparatus. It was like on special occasion, we go get the box. No, I am not kidding you. And, you know, when I first started doing drills, which is, you know, training in the fire service, I would have all the guys line up in my company and take the boxes out, put them in front of them, put the breathing apparatus. Well, you thought some of these guys were scuba divers. They had them upside down. They, they couldn't figure out how to put them, put them on because it, it wasn't something that we used every day. It, it's hard to believe, isn't it? It is is hard to believe. It is. But, but that is, you know, that goes from uh, of w the way that we fought fires based on the way that fires were. The fires changed and we didn't change and we had to play catch up. And to, to learn that, we, we, we um, you know, usually in safety, you're usually learning from blood. You're learning from people dying. And, and, you know, we were killing 500 firefighters a year. And, um, and somebody finally just said, wait, we need to step back here. What we used to do was fine for what we used to have. Well, now what we have is, is different and we need to change to fit that. It's sad that we have to learn from blood. No, it is, but that's human nature. It really is. When there's, when there's enough pain and when we're on the precipice of that pain, that's when we change. Yeah. If we're just comfortable enough, just comfortable enough to stay right there. You're right. You know? You're right. It, because it, it takes a bump. It takes a bump to get over that. Tons. Yeah. And, and I guess I'm okay with that because then I'm really motivated and I'm really ready. Aligned and yeah. 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 Uh, Sometimes you have to get there, and that, that's really unfortunate sometimes that it has to be that way. And I don't know what else to say. I mean, you know, we, we have we have a, a tool that we can use to say this, these are leading indicators. This is this is a trend. You right. know what I mean? And you hope, you really hope that people are looking at that trend and saying, I'm going to make a change before something happens. You know, and and that's what then that's what a lot of people are talking about now. And a lot of safety people are talking about that leading indicators yeah. instead of lagging indicators. Years. This could happen. I'm seeing the information. Yeah, and, and I just did a, a presentation yesterday, and, and a lot of what I talk about is organizational health, and and the place that I, I try to rally safety professionals is around process health, because pr the process is where the imbalance lives, where the risk lives, and if you can understand process health, you can actually predict risk, never mind measure risk, and 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 it, that. Can anybody do it? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody can do it. Yes, anybody can do it. I see somebody being like, I can't. No, no, no. I, I can. No, it's not. It's not. There's just a, like in anything, there's just a set of rules that you have to follow and a way you have to look at things. It's a little different than the way you've looked at things in the past. Um, but once it clicks, it works for everything. It works for ethics. It works for safety. It works for everything because it is the way that organizations function. And I, I've kind of found the essence if you will. Okay, we're going back to physics, right? Okay. I, I found the theorem of... You're using it! Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, How many years? Circle. Exactly, full circle. But I've derived the, the process by which you can go and find out 
how organizations work. And then if you know how organizations work, you can predict how they fail. And if you can predict how they fail, you can get ahead of failure. It's, I don't want to sound like Nostradamus here, but you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it, it's really how you're able to predict is if you can basically see, you've got a data set of things that come together that align to create a certain outcome like math, right? You know, we know that one in three equals four, it always does. And if you understand what those numbers look like when you're seeing them, then you can actually create the thing on the other side of the equal sign before it happens. Before it happens. Yeah, and, and I think the challenge in the safety profession is really that transition to transition the management of an organization who's so used to measuring results, I mean, everything they do is results measures. And that's why TRIR and, and incident rates and all that stuff fit into that category because it's a result. It's a hard, measurable result, right? And transitioning them from the fact that we need to measure results, so we need to measure the precursors to results. And, and that is... If, if you don't have a good correlation between the precursors and the results, those folks are not comfortable with that. So you have to walk them from outcomes back up to realizing that we should not be waiting for outcomes to judge risk from outcomes. And, and that's what a lot of people do. I mean, you were just talking about that, right? It takes a certain amount of outcome perception to, to get you to change. Right. And, and if I haven't seen a fatality from doing these things, then I don't think that thing can cause a fatality because I'm using my history yes. as, as the basis for when I act. It's exactly what you said. Exactly. And it's right? like somebody may say, this was enough for me. That's right. Make a change. Right. And, and the next guy say, okay, but that's right. this bottom is my bottom. That's right. And, this, it, and that person may say, that's enough. Yeah. This happened. It, no, right? and, and it's based on their history. Exactly. It's based on, right. Perception history yeah their, yeah their life yeah no exactly kid, exactly up, learning what they learned i mean this is no it's exactly it and and when you're in an organization we can't afford to have a bunch of people thinking separately based on their life experiences right we don't do quality that way hey when's the last time this uh, airplane crashed because of what i'm doing i don't know it never happened so what i'm doing must be okay no not necessarily and I always say to people, you know, you can have a bad process and get good outcomes for very long periods of time. I mean, think, of, right, think about driving, right? You can look at your phone and you can drive over the speed limit, which a lot of people do, and not get in an accident for, for years and years and think that's okay. And eventually it will Catches up with you. It does. It does. And then, you, then you're surprised. <laughs> right? Right. Right. You're, so You're surprised. Right. Like, I'm surprised? <laughs> what happened? Right. I don't know what right. happened. Well, because this paradigm that I've created, I have I believe it's successful because you know what? It balances productivity. For, and for you, it's getting there quicker and, and yeah. you know, a multitasking and all those other things. I'm productive. And look, I'm safe because I'm measuring safe on what? The, the absence of bad outcomes. I'm good. And so now you say, hey, this is actually an efficient and safe way. No, it's not. No, it's not. Oh, this has been great. <laughs> yeah, yes, 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 most definitely. So tell me where people can find you because I have a feeling you are inspiring a lot of people, not just here, but, but everywhere in your life. I can just feel that from you. So where can people find you to, to be inspired by you? Right, read, read those wonderful articles that you wrote that you don't read. Yeah, that, I, I think they're on the bottom of somebody's birdcage somewhere. <laughs> And that's okay. Maybe the birds are reading them. <laughs> Do people have birds? Yes, people have birds. I know. I have friends that have birds. I know one person has a bird. And she, oh, this is great. She does this Zoom meeting with me every week. And I'm like, make it. They're always shut up. Oh, my God. It's like, yeah, well, the, the birds have no filter on either end. Oh, my God. She starts talking. The bird just, just goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and I have to practice. And you know what the challenge is with birds? Birds, some of these birds live longer than people do. I mean, they're, they're they to live to eighty years old. I did not know that. Oh yeah. So maybe yeah. choose wisely on your birds. Yeah, choose wisely. I think I think it's tough to have a dog. We just got a dog, and you're set for yeah, yeah, yeah. But dogs are like 
Dogs are like family members. Cats, yeah. cats are a little different. Cats could give a, you know what about? Cats, you, right. can, cats you can really separate yourself from. Yeah. Well, they separate themselves from you too. Right. So right. Yeah. Like you know what? You don't care about me. I don't care about you. <laughs> you know. I left you the box and the food. What else do you need? Right. No, exactly. Okay. How exactly. can people find you? Um, well, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest place. Uh, it, it's Peter Pete Suska, uh, and then I'm also on there as uh, OPEX Safety, uh, uh, O P X. Then the word safety. Okay. Uh, and that's probably the easiest place for everybody to find me. And then just uh, contact me. And you know, I mean, if you want to talk, I am happy to talk to anyone, uh, because l like you said, really, I'm here to to help people help people and uh and uh and i think uh the approach um that i use uh just works it, it works for more than safety so yeah no i appreciate it thank you all right take care thank you for joining us on the safety pro round table this podcast is brought to you by sospis bringing you the best eh software in the industry if you're ready to learn more about how an EHS software can transform your safety program, your profits, and your entire company, head to www.sospis.com slash podcast. That is www.sospes.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time on the Safety Pro Roundtable.